four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, the show where a couple of friends get together and watch an episode of Transformers Generation One and then get together and talk about what they saw. So we are now into season one of the series, episode five or episode two, depending on how you're counting, because uh, we did start with a three episode mini series that was like the pilot of the series. Yeah, kind of like the pilot movie. And now we're like in the first 13 episode season. So this is effectively episode five. Uh, Roll for it. A little bit of backstory on this one for me. Um, This was one. So I think we've explored in the show before. uh, My parents owned a video store when I was a kid. And uh, and I worked at it through like, you know, my preteen through my teenage years. And this was one of the FHG videotapes that they had in the store's collection. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I watched this one a lot as a young person. Like, I didn't just watch it as a young kid, but I watched it well into my teens repeatedly. And as, as a result, this has become kind of a, I want to say like an iconic season one episode for me. Like, this is an episode that I feel like is almost like the platonic ideal of Transformers season one episodes. Um, because it doesn't develop anything new. There's no new inventions. There's no new characters, right? This is just a rip-roaring adventure based on the premise established in the first miniseries. Well, there are new characters. There's no new Transformers, I should say. True. But who are we, Jersey? Who are we? Oh, that's right. (laughs) <laughs> it is customary to, for the host to introduce themselves. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... I am Hoover. There. Now we got that out of the way. Now we know who's who. So now we can talk about Roll For It. Written by George Arthur Bloom and Doug Booth. And the log line reads, The Decepticons go after the antimatter formula in order to gain ultimate power. The laboratory scientist sends the formula to a young genius named Chip. The Autobots must keep him and the formula safe. Yes, and much like you, maybe I even got it from you, I don't remember, but I definitely had this episode either recorded off a store-bought tape or as a store-bought tape in the 90s. So this was one of those that I saw a lot of. Mm -hmm. I also remember I had uh, More Than Meets the Eye on a store-bought tape that had all three episodes. Uh, I I can... Literally remember finding that at a Big Lots store. That was a fun find. And that was oh, way wow. after the fact. That was probably probably 95, maybe 94, 95, somewhere around there. But it was like old store stock from 1984 or so. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, I didn't actually get to see more than meets the eye again until like well into my, like it was like the early, early 90s. So it was in my teen years. And yeah, I I had a whole mess of VHS tapes of taped Transformers episodes, and I had virtually the entire series on VHS except for the very first miniseries. So I remember finding that and being very excited. And then at the video store, we had Heavy Metal War, Roll For It, and oh, and Fire in the Sky. They were three three video cassettes with only one episode. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I think of the abundance we're living in now where we just go to Tubi.tv and just watch as many episodes as we want. <laughs> nope. We needed to have one episode on one videotape that sometimes we literally paid thirty nine ninety nine for. That was literally the price of some videotapes back then. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Uh, but in, so th- this episode, I mean, like I rewatched it in preparation for this discussion i noticed some things that i want to bring to the discussion but for the most part it's it's an episode i can almost recite because i've seen it so many times but <laughs> it starts with we just see start like two decepticon jets which look they're both gray and then like sound waves flying along with them and what 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 are we seeing oh where, where did we leave off in the last episode um we're not into like episodic adventure quite yet this this episode feels episodic a, a little bit but it, it continues on like seconds after the last episode in which uh, Megatron got sucked into deep space through the space bridge and Starscream said, Megatron's dead. I'm in charge now. <laughs> and this episode starts like right on that moment, right? At least not too, not too far after, like maybe, maybe a couple hours later, but Starscream's essentially reiterating the same thing. 
He's like, hey, guys, in case you've forgotten the past hour after we flew away, Megatron's dead and I'm in command now. Yes, Starscream, you already told us that 18 <laughs> times. Maybe it's just like, you know, he's waited for it for so long. It's just like, it's just fun to say. It bears repeating. Hmm. Guys, did you know I'm in charge? Just, just, I just wanted to set the record straight and in case anybody missed it, you know? I just love saying it. I'm in charge. And in this episode, there's like a lot of really interesting animation in this one too. This is like the most like anime of the Transformers episodes until we get to Call of the Primitives. There's a lot of like attempting uh, unusual amounts of movement mm -hmm. and also some very Bishonen humans in this one. Yeah. And I, I, I definitely like your word attempting movement because... <laughs> You can tell they're trying, but it looks rough in a lot of places. Like there's this scene where Starscream basically almost flies right into Soundwave, and you can tell he he has to like scramble to get out of the way, and then he's sort of like gesturing and shaking his fist at him as he flies away. But it doesn't look that great animated. It's kind of hard to read what's happening, but yeah, Starscream mm -hmm. like like veers to the right really fast and comes at the camera where Soundwave is in the foreground, and Soundwave like dodges out of the way. I guess it kind of looks like that, and then yeah, it freezes on Soundwave like looking after Starscream as he flies away, kind of like in this whole like oh you kind of pose, and they're heading for uh, another power plant, <laughs> and it worked before. Why not keep at it? And so yeah, they they land in this power plant, and there's all these guys in yellow hard hats course that's the that's the transformer shorthand for uh blue collar working men <laughs> it, did you notice that, like when the guys are like when they're like oh it's decepticons get help like one of the guys puts his arm around one yes. of the other guys it looks really <laughs> awkward <laughs> it doesn't look like he's pointing at something he's afraid of it's more like hey buddy it's christmas look at the lights over there <laughs> <laughs> like the pose just doesn't look like it matches the emotion of the moment no yeah, I actually, in, in this is, uh, what is it? The, those jets sound like they're going to land in our lap. That's because they are! And then the tr jets land and trans transform into Starscream, Thundercracker, and Soundwave. And, uh, you know, they call the police this time. <laughs> or some kind of security. Some kind of men who are not wearing hard hats. Yeah. And so, all right, you overgrown bolt buckets. Halt, we've got you covered. And Starscream's <laughs> like, oh, yeah. And then they just start like shooting out the, the the cover that the guys have. This is like we're entering the new phase where like the humans' fates are less ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they just get like their the barrels they're hiding behind get shot out from in front of them, and they just run away. So Starstream orders Soundwave to start preparing the Energon cubes. Like so, making Energon cubes is still a procedure, mm -hmm. you know, with with a order of operations. And just as they get started, you hear you know what's that? And, <laughs> Autobots are already on their way, and Prime's coming with Blue Streak and Brawn and Cliffjumper, and as proven in the past, Cliffjumper's ready to scrap with any vaguely Decepticon-shaped object. Whether it's a rock or a real Decepticon. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he goes running at them, and hey, Thundercracker does stuff! This is like, <laughs> let's we should have a tally on the times that Thundercracker actually gets to do something in this show. <laughs> yeah, like one bash coming up, and it sure is, and Thundercracker <laughs> whacks him. This is a pretty interesting scene. Uh, we're, we're actually going to get to meet like like proper Braun now. Yep, Braun's sounding normal as we see him in all the subsequent episodes. Like we mentioned before in More Than Meets the Eye Part 2, he was sounding a little off. Uh, he eventually settles into a sort of different voice for him, and this debuts that. Yeah, now he starts sounding like 70s meaty hunk. <laughs> L little bit of smarm in there. A little bit of like little. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of an actor who like evokes that kind of character. I bet Corey Burton had somebody in mind when he did it. Mm -hmm. But like when you think of like super tan buff dude, like that's the voice like I associate with it. But but yeah, Cliff Jumper gets whacked with a support beam and then he flies across the room <laughs> and falls into Braun, mm -hmm. who who is roughly the same size as Cliff Jumper, right? He's only like a little bit taller, a little bit thicker. Mm -hmm. But when Cliff Jumper just like bounces off of him, he's like, yeah. Braun doesn't move at all. Yeah, I don't think physics works that way, but I guess maybe <laughs> if Braun is heavy enough, that could work. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm not here to de debate physics. 
Well, I mean, it's just again through like a little kid, like watching him, I was like, oh my gosh, he's so powerful. He's so <laughs> powerful that when his friend gets thrown into him, he just stands there and smiles. <laughs> and he's like, all right, you want to do it again, Cliff Jumper? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And then Cliff Jumper above you, and Starscream has a giant piece of machinery holding over them. So Starscream brandishes a huge metal something or other. We can't really tell what it's supposed to be. It looks vaguely cylindrical, I think. And it's like, here's this part of this factory that I'm going to smash you with, Prime. As he's running in, Prime says this little cute little line. You're about to become instant junk. Try picking on a mechanism your own size. Stop! So, okay. I have an issue with this scene that this is something that bad guys do too often in these cartoons is you'll notice if you watch it, I mean, you can hear it in the clip, but if you watch it on the, on the show, Starscream telegraphs his punch. He totally telegraphs his punch. He stands above them and takes the time to say, you're about to become instant junk. Optimus grabs Starscream and then issues his threat, right? Or his, 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 uh, his, his comeback. So it's like, do the thing first, then like Arnold Schwarzenegger taught us this, do the thing, <laughs> then have the one liner. Like he, you don't say, you know, I'll be back before you do the thing, you know? Well, actually he didn't terminate. <laughs> my point is, is that this is something Starscream has a bad habit of is like, I'm about to do something awesome. <laughs> giving the good right. guys time to stop him from doing something awesome. Well, that's kind of the typical uh, generic villain problem. I'm going to monologue for an unnecessary amount of time. And it's going to give you enough time to stop whatever I'm doing. Wait a minute, what are you doing? And then they do it, and then they say, I did that. So anyway, so Prime like knocks the thing out of his hand, and then uh, <laughs> it's a great great Starscream uh, you know, wienerness here. Is that it, All he can do is go, stop! <laughs> <laughs> Once again, he is, uh, he doesn't have the courage of his own convictions. He talks big, and that's all he's got. Because the moment somebody... Like the mechanism of his own size gets in his way. All he can do is, like, what the, uh, stop! <laughs> and the energon cubes, like the thing that falls on the energon cubes, right? The thing that Optimus knocks out of his hands. There's a big explosion and Soundwave is like on the ground. He's like shaking his head like, oh, ah, what a, what a, what a, he a headache I've got. <laughs> and then he decides he's had enough. He's had enough failure under Starscream for one day. So Soundwave gives the order to retreat. And though you might think Starscream's going to be a little uh, ticked off, taking issue with Soundwave giving him an order, Starscream's only too happy to re retreat at this time. And he pushes past Prime, and he gets out of Dodge. This is one of those moments where I feel like the animation actually, like what they were trying to do with like the extra movement in the episode uh, really works. Like when he pushes past Prime and says, you'll pay for this, Prime. Like they punctuate the pay for this with, he, with a shove. Mm -hmm. And then he like sort of crouches and then blasts out of the room a little bit. Yeah, that that part looks that that always has looked really nice to me. Mm -hmm. And he and he, he and Thundercracker fly out, and then Soundwave, who can fly, right? Like yeah. it's been established he can fly. He was just flying like five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what happens here? Like when Soundwave starts, like runs away. So Soundwave exits the building and immediately like turns to his right, and here's where the an animation attempts to get really expressive but ultimately comes off as looking really awkward as Soundwave stumbles while running and then he even falls through this weird net barrier thing that I don't understand what it was supposed to be. It was like literally looks like a volleyball net, but taller that's just sort of like randomly placed there. I don't think I've ever seen a net barrier in my life, but here's one. Well, I don't know if there was like supposed to be an antenna or something. I don't know what it, I, I, I'm equally confused by it. It literally looks like a 30 foot tall volleyball net that like mm -hmm. for some reason he runs into and, and rips through in this very clumsy way. Just trying to show like Soundwave is is on his heels. You know, he, he is not at peak capacity here and they got him on the run. And then this next shot is actually really pretty where like the shots at an angle. Blue Streak and Prowl come around the corner. Now it's a, a one-point perspective shot looking straight down the, like, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Like the top of the building. And as they come around the corner, they transform into car mode. But they don't just, like, 
like duck down and transform into car mode like they have in the past. Like they flip in the air, like they do this like little tumble, like a uh, roll like a burrito into car mode, right? <laughs> The Autobots have been hanging out at Chipotle, so they've been getting some new ideas about attack maneuvers. <laughs> it, it's a really pretty shot, you know? It's like, when I was a kid, I remember thinking, like, this is exciting. This is like, why aren't why aren't all Transformers episodes like this? Because as we'll, we'll explore when we get into season, end of season, when we're after season two, I should say, uh, where the battles just turn into, like, them just standing across, like, a, mm -hmm. a desert alleyway and just shooting <laughs> at each other. <laughs> it's like, the, the the battles in this are super imaginative, and so, like, mm -hmm. they tumble and they roll at them. By the way, Prowl and Blue Streak, this is, like, their first, like, scene, proper scene in the series where they actually have to do something more than just respond to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should mention their voice actors. Prowl's Michael Bell, whom we've heard a couple times, and Blue Streak is Casey Kasem. I... We may have heard him once or twice say something, but uh, yeah. he hasn't been very prominent in the show as of yet. He has right. almost the same character model as Prow, except Prow is a police car and Blue Streak is a regular car. Mm. So they're very similar looking, and boy, does this confuse the subtle artists. Because a lot of times we'll be looking at Blue Streak, and then the, the scene shifts, and suddenly Blue, Blue Streak is Prow. And then it'll switch back, and it just, it's a mess. <laughs> All you got to know is Blue Streak and Prowl are both there and both doing things. Yeah. But uh, they they transform into car mode, and they ram Soundwave, yeah. and he goes flying through the air. And this is also unique because this is the only time I can think of where we ever hear uh, Soundwave scream. Mm. Uh... <laughs> yeah. It's not like, ah, you know, it's just like, ah, it's this weird, like, uh, guttural thing that he does. And and he tumbles through the air and it's like, okay, sound wave will recover. You can fly, right? But he doesn't. He like turns into tape deck mode and Starscream scoops him up. Yeah. This is weirdly reminiscent of the early comic books where they did not have all the Decepticons just be able to fly. Like the Seekers could in their alt modes. And oftentimes, Megatron and Soundwave both return into their uh, cassette player and gun modes and just hang out in the cockpit of one of the Seekers while they were flying somewhere. <laughs> so this is weirdly reminiscent of that, but it's like, but we just saw Soundwave flying like less than five minutes ago, probably. So I don't know why they chose to do this. It's very, very odd. I'm surprised you don't have a theory about this because I have a theory. Okay. When the Energon cubes were exploded by Optimus knocking that thing out of Starscream's hand, and it, the explosion happens, you see Soundwave on the floor, like sitting on the floor, and he's like shaking his head, like, oh, 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 oh what was that? I wonder if his gyroscope got screwed up, and that's why he's like running clumsily. My equilibrium. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if a scene got cut or something because mm -hmm. like that would explain why he can't fly right, why he can't run right, and it's like, well, transform then. Just get into tape deck mode, and I'll carry you home. Yeah, that's but, that's pro something like that probably did happen because there's a lot of like cut lines here and there that we've since found out about over the years. So there probably yeah. was something that explained it a little better. But didn't <laughs> they they apparently didn't think it was that important to tell us cuz they didn't leave it in. Well, I, I I just wonder how much they had to cut for this one cuz this this is another thing. This episode is packed with stuff. A mm -hmm. lot of things happen in this episode, which is something that I feel like the later episodes started to get a little bit more decompressed. Yeah. But yeah, so then as they're, then Thundercracker joins Starscream in the sky, they're flying away, and then Blue Street transforms and like shoots them with something that makes them like spin around. Do you know yeah, what that means? They sort of is? like fritz out in the air. Like they look like they've gotten like some sort of electrical shock or something. So, so maybe Blue Streak's cannons do some kind of special thing. Like everyone else has a special power, but they don't yeah. really go into it here. I haven't looked at his foul card recently, so I, I don't remember what his, his shoulder cannons can do. But, yeah, it effectively, like, electrocutes them and makes them, like, kind of spin around out of control. But then they regain their control, and they fly away, and Thundercracker... <laughs> this, this is where we get to a recurring theme with Thundercracker in Season 1. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they're flying away, and Thundercracker has something to say. The leader you turned out to be, Starscream! Okay, so they're flying away, and Thundercracker's not happy about uh, Starscream's leadership. But what's interesting here is that I want to point out that 
last episode when Megatron was sucked into the space bridge, all the Decepticons were together and Starscream declared himself leader. Mm-hmm. And the episode ended. And this yeah. episode started. And yeah. suddenly Starscream is only with Thundercracker and Soundwave. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes me wonder, did the rest of the Decepticons say, oh, crap, Starscream's leader now. I quit. <laughs> they, they're just like hanging out in their neighborhood under the sea and all their houses. They're just having little block parties. As we'll see later on, some of them are just hanging out by the space bridge. So <laughs> I, I have a feeling like as soon as the Autobots went for home, like half of the Decepticons went like, let's go back and wait to see if Megatron comes home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be right with you, Starscream. <laughs> We're coming, oh, we're coming. I wish I could go with you to the power plant. Oh, I just got to uh, uh, <laughs> do some menial space bridge uh, task here. Or, oh, I wish I didn't have to. <laughs> I went to the power plant yesterday. I'm sorry. Otherwise, I'd go. But, um, yeah, so then we cut to, since this is like a Thundercracker setting us up with a segue, some leader you turned out to be Starscream. Speaking of, and then we fly through outer space and we get to mm-hmm. Cybertron and we see that Shockwave and Megatron are hanging out, and Megatron is saying, uh, "I got to find out what's going on back there." Mm-hmm. Shockwave, show me, show me what's happening on Earth. There's no telling what's going to happen with Starscream running things. But also, I think maybe partly Megatron's a little bored because Shockwave's been taking him on a tour of the planet. He's like, <laughs> "Remember, remember, this is your favorite uh, favorite steak place. It's the same <laughs> as you left it." I told you I was going to leave everything the same as when you were here last. I left it that way. I'm not way. a liar, Megatron. I, I am not a liar. This is the, I promised you something, and I deliver my promises. That's me, Shockwave, your most loyal lieutenant. <laughs> Megatron's like, okay, okay. Let me get back to Earth. <laughs> But yeah, so like Shockwave's like, it's like, oh, well, we'll find out soon enough. And he like tweaks some buttons on his computer. And then like we see Starscream on mm. the screen. Yeah, this is, I can't really complain about this too much because this is present in pretty much any sci-fi cartoon or even partly sci-fi cartoon. It's like if a character needs to call another character, there's some sort of weird way he can see that character. There just happens to be some kind of weird flying camera along with them. And I mean, I guess you could say like, well, maybe Reflector was with them the whole time, like beaming a shot back to Cybertron. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, it happens everywhere. So I really can't, uh, I really can't rag on Transformers for it. Oh, and and, and it's, it's, we got 21 minutes. It's a point, it's a point that's clear. Star- right. Megatron. If if we saw like the interior of Starscream's cockpit or something, right, or like like the the chair of like that that is in Starscream's cockpit, like we're looking through Starscream's dashboard or something, it, it's not immediate. We wouldn't know right. exactly what he's looking at. And so, yes, this is one of those things where it's like if you question it too much, you break the poetry of mm. the thing. But he says, <laughs> Megatron, you're still alive. <laughs> You know, don't sound so pleased, but now now pay attention. And I love this line. We will attack the laboratory as planned. So yeah. another th- thing this these cartoons do is like they're so economical in their storytelling. Mm-hmm. They're taking it on faith that if he says we will attack the laboratory as planned. Oh, well, clearly they had a conversation about this uh-huh. yesterday before the whole space bridge thing happened. And now he's saying like he's just reminding them of that. And it's clear enough that we know it is a laboratory. And then he, he even says, like, oh, the, the antimatter formula will give us the key to ultimate power or something like that, right? And then Thundercracker takes this opportunity to kiss the butt of his n- new, I guess, new old leader, Megatron. And he says, We will attack the laboratory as planned. The antimatter formula will give us the key to ultimate power. Wonderful, Megatron. With your leadership, we can't fail. Leadership, my sign function. So five billion astroseconds. Here we are with astroseconds again. <laughs> That's and I just a lot of astroseconds. I just I it makes you think it's like it's a precision thing, right? It's actually mm. probably like thirty five minutes. But like yeah. Transformers run on such tight schedules that they have to measure in the billionth of a second, you know? 
So Megatron's like, all right, I'm out. And then Shockwave's like, all right, I'll send you home. And this is one of those rare moments we actually get to see the space bridge operating in reverse, where it's actually sending something to Earth. Mm -hmm. Usually it's the other way, and we get the Earth perspective, but now we get the Cybertron perspective. Yeah. And the, bla the beams come down, a bunch of lightning and whatever, and then the door. Then we see Megatron's head poking out of the top of the space bridge, and then it <laughs> opens up. And uh, all the kids who stayed back there to wait for him are there. <laughs> yep, Laser Beacon Rumbler here. And this scene has always meant a lot to me in a weird way. It's hard for me to explain, but I'm going to try. So Megatron shows up here. And this happens. Greetings, Laser Beak Rumble. Megatron, uh, I got news for you. Reflector will be back soon with a lab report. Excellent. For some reason, it means a lot to me that Megatron says, Greetings, Laser Beak Rumble. It, I don't know why, but it, to me, it really says something that Megatron just has a nice little hello for Rumble and Laserbeak. <laughs> I mean, he's not just a despot tyrant leader. Right. Like, like, so like, the, yeah, you better be here. It's like, bow down to me right now. You know, it's not, well, yeah, he's not your mentor. He's just like, greetings. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for waiting. Boy, <laughs> boy, do waiting. I have some stuff about Shockwave to tell you guys. Oh, <laughs> that guy. I'm so glad we left about Cybertron. Again, not to cross fandoms, but. The moment I knew I loved the Star Wars character, General Grievous, was when he's walking down the ramp of his ship. He's just got home, like the Imperial shuttle kind of deal, that scene. He's walking down that ramp, and like one of his troops is waiting for him, and he pushes the troop out of the way, like for no reason. It's just like, I just want to push a guy. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's the kind of villain he is, right? He's like that kind of fish shaking, soliloquizing bully villain. And based on what we've seen, you would kind of assume that Megatron is also kind of like that. But, I mean, he's he's not. I mean, the, there's scenes where, especially with Laserbeak and Ravage, I find, he's, like, very into them. He's, like, very pleased they're his troops. And he's, like, you know, he, he gives them credit when credit's due. He's not just a tyrant forcing everyone to work for him. You know, it's like he's got a good rapport with some of his troops. One one thing that Generation 1, I think, fails to adequately explain for me is why Megatron wants to run everything, right? Like, yeah. it, it never gets explored. I don't think it necessarily needs to be, but it's like, so we have to do a lot of inferring about mm -hmm. his, like, why he's doing what he's doing. And so these little moments like this are, like, things that you latch on to, right? It's like, okay, well, he's... Mm -hmm. He's not purely just a selfish child because he does speak respectfully to some of his troops, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, he, he never he never pushes Soundwave around, right? He never threatens Soundwave. No. There's one little scene in uh, season two, I think, where it's like he's complaining about something Soundwave is, is doing, and then, mm -hmm. like, seconds later, he, realize, he realizes that Soundwave is actually showing him something good. So it's mm. like he he almost takes it right back. So it's like he, even <laughs> even when you think there's going to be a scene of him complaining about Soundwave, it's not. Yeah. So yes, we get a few little tiny clues. Like there's like a line in an upcoming episode where he says, "What I do now, I do for my fellow Decepticons," and it grieves me that you Autobots will also profit from this. You know. Mm. Um. But like there. So yeah, he he hates Starscream, but the rest of his troops like he has a kind of respect which means he's not mm -hmm. like totally he is he's a tyrant but he's not like maniacal tyrant at least we can make that inference so yeah reflector will be back soon with the lab report megatron says excellent and then we cut to bumblebee driving along with spike and another kid well before you talk about these lame autobots mm -hmm. i would like to point mm -hmm. out that it's you say megatron hates starscream but i would not to get <laughs> too deep into the Megatron Starscream relationship here, but it'll definitely be touched on multiple times in the future. I don't mm -hmm. think Megatron hates Starscream. I think Megatron respects Starscream for his drive, determination, ambition. Ambition. Yeah. Because, I mean, 
is Thundercracker ever going to take over and lead? Is Reflector ever going to take over and lead? These guys are just there to do a job. And I think they're happy to do that job. I think they have motivations and reasons they do that job. But they've got no ambition. And if you think about the whole Season 1 army of Decepticons, really nobody has ambition except Starscream got all the ambition. So <laughs> is Megatron just respecting him for that and sort of sort of has a grudge <laughs> against the other Decepticons because they don't have any ambition? I mean, we're definitely going to touch on Megatron and uh, Starscream more in the future, but yeah, I just we plant we... that little seed. Sure. It, yeah, we we have spent years and years debating this idea. Mm-hmm. Like, what is their what is their relationship? Okay, so tabled for a future discussion. Um, yes. But yes, proceeding with the episode, we cut to Bumblebee who has like two humans inside him. And he's driving along, and they pull up to this laboratory. Could it be the laboratory that Megatron was mentioning? Probably. <laughs> And they pull it. They pull up to the gate, and they both get out of the car. And the guard is like, "Chip, Spike, great to see you guys." Mm-hmm. And Chip is the kid with glasses in a wheelchair. And Bumblebee transforms, of course. And <laughs> they all they all go inside, and he's like, "Let me get you through our security door." And uh, he hits the little code on there. So, do you want to talk about Chip now, or do you want to talk about Chip later? What do you want sure. to talk about, Chip? Talk about Chip. Who's this guy we just met? Chip Chase, boy genius in a wheelchair, who is the sweetest, most earnest, most, uh, most like, oh gosh, I, how do I describe his personality? Courage. He's just he, he's kind and guileless, but he's but he's super brave, right? So he's mm-hmm. like he's just like he's everything that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know I went through this this phase when I was like 12 to like 14 or whatever where I was like, oh my God, I hate the humans. Oh, if only they didn't have the humans in the show, I would be, they would like the show so much better. And I think it's because like I, when I was really young, I had this like power fantasy about adulthood. I think we've talked about this before, mm-hmm. right? It's like adults know how to make decisions. And I'm a, this dithering, sensitive kid, <laughs> art kid, who doesn't know how to navigate problems. Mm-hmm. And adults just seem to do it. They know they know who to vote for. You know, I don't know who to <laughs> vote for. How do you do it? It's amazing. And so the fantasy for me was being one of the Autobots or be like, you know, me personally being friends with Bumblebee. But I didn't want to see any other humans in there. And so I think at the time I was really overlooking like what the humans bring to the table and what they present is that this mm-hmm. idea that here's a kid who is he's differently abled, right? Mm-hmm. And yet there are times where he looks a Decepticon in the face is like, no way, not gonna happen. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> What a cool kid, you know, and then and, but he never loses that that earnest, sweet spark about him. So he is a computer genius who is somehow friends with Spike and friends with the guy we're about to meet in the lab, Dr. Alcazar, who is developing the antimatter formula. But before we do that, before we go in there, the, the security guard pushes like two, five, eight on the little keypad <laughs> in front of the door. And then they go inside and we see up on a ledge is a camera <laughs> that is watching them. A very familiar looking camera. And this camera talks to himself a bit <laughs> while flying off with three <laughs> identical, slightly out of sync voices. Yeah. Uh, th- this is a pretty neat looking transformation scene here when the reflector converts to robot modes. Mm-hmm. They fly up and there's all like this forced perspective as they're coming back down. And then they fly away and he's like, he says that was the last bit of info I needed, right? So that that like ties or cinches up this idea that it is one personality with three bodies, which is mm-hmm. super strange. But he flies away and uh, he he makes a little uh, speech to himself. There, that was the last bit of info I needed. Stealing the antimatter formula is gonna be a piece of oil cake. Oil cake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I like the vehicular puns. Uh, Get it? I, it's a piece of cake, but they're robots, so they like oil, so it's oil cake. Get it? I wish they would have worked a little harder on that one. <laughs> well, this is George Arthur Bloom partly writing this episode, and yeah. most of the vehicle and robot puns were in More Than Meets the Eye. That's true. Which was written by him. So, And I do love them. I Maybe love sticking a neutral Megatron. Him. 
But but oil cake, I just feel like it could have been you could work that. I don't know. Maybe that's that's kids will get it. They understand piece of cake and they understand that robots need oil. So I guess right. it's, it's it's a serviceable it's a serviceable line. <laughs> but it's also I guess it just emphasizes too just how weird reflector is. <laughs> Like, I want to see that scene again, but there's another Decepticon with him, right? Like, Rumble's with him. And he's like, it's going to be a piece of oil cake. And the Rumble's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why did I have to get paired with him? But we go back in the lab and we meet Dr. Alcazar, played by John Stevenson, who's, like, saying that Chip assisted with the development of the antimatter formula. And he uh, hands him a floppy disk, one of those five-inch floppy disks from when we were little kids. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're, we're getting to the part where this episode is super interesting to me. He's like, oh, this diskette will let your computer talk with our mainframe here anytime, day or night. Day or night? Wow. Day or night. I know. Being able to <laughs> like, have a computer that talks to another computer, you know? This, this seems pretty sci-fi to me when I was that age. Although... Mm. My, my parents had a home office for my dad's private practice, and uh, they did have a modem where, like, you actually took, like, the phone off the hook and, like, put it in another cradle or something. I don't remember exactly how it worked. But, like, it it worked on the phone lines, but you just, like, it had, like, a phone receiver or something in it. So I, I, I even looked up 1984 dial-up technology, and okay. it looks like at the time in 1984 you could connect at such lightning-fast speeds as... 18,432 bits per second, which is not fast. 18K. In the 90s, we were all connecting at like 56,000, and this is like 18,000. So, yeah, it is it is what it is for the time. Your GIFs are going to, or rather, it was, it was the progressive JPEGs back then that loaded line <laughs> by line. Uh, it, would, it would be a long wait for your, you know, strong bad email in 1984. <laughs> Deleted! So he's like, can't wait to test it out. So they're driving home, and then all of a sudden, now this part confuses me. Like, why did this happen? Because like they're driving home, and Chip's like, I've never seen a bird like that before. Because I'm really earnest and kind, <laughs> and I am not the least bit cynical or suspicious about anything that's ever happening around me. And uh, that's no bird. That's Laserbeak. <laughs> and he starts shooting at him, and then they go into an under par underground parking garage. Right. Of course, Laserbeak can't possibly follow them into an underground parking garage. So that's that's my new fan in Laser Beacon. Don't be afraid of parking garages. <laughs> oh, he's got he's got a story like Phoebe Cates and Gremlins, where he's like this, this oh, horrific God. thing happened to him in a parking garage. <laughs> and now every time I go, I just think about Buzzsaw and how I've never seen him again since then. <laughs> so yeah, like why did Laser Beak attack them? Well, maybe he could just detect that it was Bumblebee, and <laughs> Bumblebee always warrants an attack. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, is it, that just, it just seems odd to me that that happened because that, I mean it precipitates the next scene, but it just it doesn't it doesn't feel like it, it is explained or matches up with everything else that's been happening. But he flies to Megatron and like lands on Megatron's forearm and like so squawks at his face, mm -hmm. <laughs> and somehow Megatron can understand this. He's like, "Oh, they got away. They'll yeah. contact Optimus Prime." We can't wait for Starscream. We got to go to the lab now. And, you know, to touch on my earlier theory about Megatron actually enjoying his troops, he's not mad at Laserbeak. Yeah. He's just like, they got away. That's he's true. not like, how dare you fail me, Laserbeak? Right, right. Yeah, he doesn't like say like the punishment for failure is death or anything like that. So, I mean, and actually, yeah, actually, I'm glad we're talking about this because this is, this is going to be interesting. Um, comparison and contrasting when we get to Galvatron because mm. Galvatron really is much about like he's, he's just punching his troops left and right <laughs> but Megatron doesn't do that anyway so the, they go off to go attack the lab but then we're following Bumblebee and he's called Prowl and Blue Streak he's like come on you gotta help me and they're like well we can't because we tracked down Starscream who he's <laughs> we we see starscream putting a new wing on thundercracker and soundwave's kind of like holding thundercracker steady <laughs> did you notice that yeah it, it's almost like i just envisioned like a few women like trying on clothes together and, <laughs> and they're like i don't know they they just like got to do it in a group and l likewise the decepticons are here oh that wing looks perfect on you <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, yes, and then Thundercracker turns around, and then they both shake their heads no, and then he comes out with a different wing, and it's, it's Thrust's wing, and they shake their heads no. Comes out again with Ramjet's wing, they shake their head no. But yeah, so they're 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 fixing themselves, like because they're repairing the damages that they have suffered at the beginning of the episode. But like, what Prowl and Blue Streak like rush in and transform in Autobot mode, and you know make a few smart mouth comments, and then. Uh, <laughs> Soundwave deploys his ultimate weapon. <laughs> so Soundwave ejects Ravage, making it four on two. Dun dun dun. And now we head for our first commercial break of the episode. Yeah, so they shoot at Prowl, he falls down, and then Ravage jumps on Blue Streak, and then like they fall into the front of the camera, and it cuts to commercial. First mm-hmm. act break. The Transformers will return after these messages. Fun to read. New Dragon Walker vehicle for use with most Masters of the Universe figures. Action figures each sold separately from Mattel. Stomper, 4x4s with headlights. Each sold separately or available in sets from Shopper. We now return to the Transformers. Okay, so we now we come back from commercial and uh, Megatron is, you know, expressing his, his his anticipation of getting a hold of all this unlimited power. And then, like, one of the Decepticons, I guess Rumble, like, laughs for it. Like, with, he's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have ultimate power. And then one of, somebody there, it's either Reflector or Rumble's like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird little laugh. Uh, and then they land, and then, like, Rumble, like, is like, oh, I know the code. And he punches the three keys of the security guard hit. And then they walk into the lab. They all just walk in, right? Conveniently, the door is large enough for Megatron to enter. So, hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then they, they they walk in. Oh, and then Chip, meanwhile, is back at home. And he's like, so Spike dropped Chip off at home before he took off to meet up with Optimus. And uh, Chip's like, oh, I'm going to warn out Dr. Alcazar. So he's typing away in the computer. And Dr. Alcazar sees on his screen the message comes in. So this is like CompuServe email. <laughs> and uh, and he says, uh, oh, my gosh, the Decepticons are here. And then all of a sudden he turns around and Megatron's there. You know. Um, <laughs> and, oh, and he, but he quickly types to erase the formula, right? Mm-hmm. Just as Rumble grabs him. That's right. You're too late. I've erased it. Megatron puts his hand over the computer, and he uses Decepticon internet technology. <laughs> and he just figures out, it's, it's just been uploaded somewhere. So we or- he orders Rumble to let the human go. They seek another. And this is another relatively compassionate act of Megatron. It's not like, well, we don't need this guy anymore, and just steps on him. It's like, this isn't the guy we need. Just throw him, throw him in the corner or something. Yeah, who knows why? I mean, except, well, I mean, for the fact that it's a kid's show and you can't just have him ruthlessly murder a person. <laughs> um, but, like, I guess maybe he's like, well, he'll be a good slave someday. And so Chip receives the formula, which must have been, what, like maybe one or two kilobytes because <laughs> <laughs> he's getting it at a speed. What's the speed he's downloading it at again? <laughs> 18,432 bits per second. And he's like, ah, he sent me the formula. I've got to keep it safe. And he opens up his disk drive. Then we cut back to Prowl and Blue Streak. And so they're fighting. Sunwave shoots him with his little gun thingy. Prowl gets hit. Oh, (laughs) this is like, this is my fate. One of my top five favorite scenes from Transformers ever. Hmm. Might be one of my bottom five scenes. Oh my gosh. The scene is so good. Uh, Prowl gets hit, hit in the stomach, and he's like, oh, what does he say? Battle computers down. I'm helpless. I must link up with another online computer. Searching. Searching. This is Autobot Prowl calling... I need help badly. My battle computer is down. Do you read me? An Autobot? Prowl, this is Chip Chase. Don't worry. I'm assuming control now. (laughs) Well, you sure had me execute a fantastic move, Chip. You think just like a regular mainframe. Thanks, Prowl. I'm doing my best. Please keep it up. We make a terrific team. So what's your problem with this? (laughs) Well, it's just the fact. Where do I begin? (laughs) 
just the fact <laughs> that a 1984 level computer yeah. could connect to an Autobot, you know, connect to a random Autobot at that, and Chip could control him using a keyboard mm-hmm. and have Prow execute all these flips and all sorts of things. You've clearly never played Overwatch, but Chip <laughs> is like a champion Overwatch player. And that's that's all there is to it. He was he was playing Overwatch before Overwatch was Overwatch. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, his his battle computer is down, and then like these little antenna come out of his head, and then he hacks into the phone lines, and like Chip, while Chip is saving the antimatter formula, Prowl just happens to call Chip. Ah, oh, the scene just makes me so happy because like it's 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 the whole like it's the earnestness of Chip. Thanks, Prowl. I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, I want to be like him. And then, uh, <laughs> and then, then it's the whole, um, you know, please keep it up. We make a terrific team. And I mean, like, you want to talk about like Mary Susan fanficking? Like, this is this is my <laughs> self insert fanfic. Like, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be truly happy until I hear like one of the Gen One Autobots say to me, you know, Jersey for a human being, you make one heck of an Autobot. Oh my god! <laughs> like I like just boil with envy you know when i watch that scene like ugh. and like chip deserves it because he's, he's great and he saved prowl's life and he you know a little little boy like got three of the most toughest decepticons to run away you know <laughs> and he does it so cheerfully it's like oh wait let's see what's next you know uh so i know it's silly and it, yes yes his computer wouldn't have the support to see out of prowl's eyes <laughs> You know, it's like it was probably like one of those screens that was like black with just green uh, right. letters on it, you know, <laughs> monochromatic computer screens. And yet they they show the screen at one point and we see like color versions of everyone there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we literally see out of Prowl's eyes. Like when he when he shows Prowl, like he has Prowl like straddle on top of a jet and smash out the cockpit and like fire the missiles off from like the cockpit. You see on Chip's screen that Prowl's hand fl- flicking the switches, you know. <laughs> So, so Chip actually had a color computer monitor in 1984, and I'm sure he was, he was the envy of all of his computer nerd friends. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a Texas Instruments computer. <laughs> so, yeah, so he, he he sends the Decepticons running, and then while uh, Starscream's flying away, Megatron locates the formula, and it's it's at Chip's house, and so he orders Starscream, Soundwave, and Thundercracker to head there. Uh, and meet up with him later. So go get the formula. And uh, Soundwave lands, ejects Ravage again, and Ravage just like bursts through the front door of the house, right? <laughs> well, it's either the front door or the door to Chip's room. And right. so Chip has copied the antimatter formula onto a, a 5.25 inch floppy and ripped it up. And to anyone who wasn't around, in yeah. the five inch floppy days, you couldn't really rip those up. <laughs> you could cut them up with scissors. Yeah. But you couldn't really rip them up. You know, I do remember trying to do it because of this episode. <laughs> of course. I wonder, I wonder how hard that is. You know, and we had a whole bunch of them because we had a Commodore 64. And so, you know, I just took an old one and just tried doing it. And yeah, you can bend them just fine, but they don't rip very easily. And not the way Chip did it. The Chip's got some serious forearm strength. Well, I guess you could say that since Chip uh, has no uh, below the waist strength, he's all forearm strength and he can rip well, up as many five and a quarter inch discs as you give him. That's right. That, that's that's his uh, his carnival show he does at the county fair in whatever city uh, he lives in in the Transformers universe. But um, yeah, he also says, I've memorized the formula, so now there's no way the Decepticons can get it. And he rips up the disc, and then Ravage jumps in. And this is one of those moments where I just, I just ugh, I'm, I'm, I'm so taken with this kid. <laughs> a, a giant metal Jaguar just jumped into your bedroom, you mm-hmm. know? And he looks at me and he's like, you're too late, Ravage. Yeah. The, the information's already been destroyed, you know? That that spunk. And and it's I think what I love about it is it's so uncool. He is so utterly square and so <laughs> brave about it, right? Like, he doesn't have a cool one-liner. He doesn't have a zinger or anything like that. It's just like, you're too late. It's already been destroyed. 
And so, like, <laughs> the next cut is Rabbit's jumping through his picture window, holding Chip in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, Rabbit doesn't care. He just scoops Chip up and just, and basically one leap, heads out Chip's window and jumps onto Starscream, who is in plane mode in the street in front of Chip's house. So there's an F-15 parked in front of Chip's house. Just imagine what Chip's neighbors think. It's like, oh, that computer nerd lives over there. <laughs> and then one day there's an F-15 in front of his house and a giant robot. Freaking Silicon Valley kids. Uh, but yeah, he, he puts he puts Chip in Starscream's like, you know, co- like cargo area or whatever. And then Soundwave congratulates him. Excellent, Ravage. But Sunbow forgot to put in the little clanging vocal effect here on Soundwave. So he just sounds like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. Yeah, I remember when I watched the episode again as a teenager and I... Was caught that scene. I was like, oh, so that's the sound he's making underneath the vocoded effect. Well, now I know. <laughs> and now I know. So, like, he's just doing like a flat performance and they're using the keyboard to actually like change the intonation and what would you say, the key or whatever. So now we cut back to the Autobots heading back to the lab. And Spike even says, Dr. Alcazar's lab, I thought we'd never get here. <laughs> and then, and Starscream, Thundercrack, and Skywarp are slowly descending onto the lab and Spike sees that they have Chip. Well, luckily, the Autobots are in full force because Bumblebee's brought Prime, Brawn, Ironhide, Sunstreaker, Hound, Wheeljack, and Ratchet. And Prime transforms a little bit before the base, and he reveals his plan to the other Autobots. Right. They got to be sneaky now because the Decepticons have a hostage. And Starscream you know, says, like, if you try anything stupid, your little friend is doomed. And Starscream says, and even if you don't, you're doomed. And then like, he does that laugh comes back from earlier in the episode. So like, apparently, this is something that... Uh, all the Decepticons have the same laugh. But yeah, so they can't attack. So Optimus says, okay, okay, here's my plan. And then we go inside. And what do we see inside the lab while Optimus is, is conversing with his Autobots? Well, we have Soundwave extracting the antimatter from that directly from Chip's brain. So like, what, what do you mean? Just extracting it directly from Chip's brain. Like, what does that look like? I mean, he's like, we're doing audio here. Did he pull out his brain? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, he just ripped it out of his skull and... Shakes it out in the antimatter form that falls out on a 5.25 inch diskette. Falls out of his brain. <laughs> so he just basically uses like his finger or something to <laughs> read his mind. Okay. Yeah, he's just like got it's like his index fingers on either side of Chip's head and they're glowing. And then like, so I was like, oh, okay, I got it. And this is again. That square bravery that I love about Chip where he says, you can't use our research for destruction. It, it's wrong. <laughs> oh, it's, it, he's, he's so, so deeply uncool. But this shot also is also where it starts looking like really, he looks super bishy here. Uh, it, you could tell that this was animated in Japan. It looks like a shot out of a Robotech episode, actually, um, <laughs> the way his face is drawn there. We go back outside. And for the second time in three episodes, Prime is wondering where Mirage is. <laughs> Where's Mirage? Sorry, Chief. I was just getting ready. Uh, so were, was we. I, that is me and my two um, holographic twins. Fine. Uh, and guess what? He was just invisible. Ah, <laughs> ah, 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 ah. And Hound's fooling around with his holograms. Ah, 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 ah. These Autobots, <laughs> man, they're hilarious. This this is a scene that we've had a lot of discussions about privately over the years. Sorry, Chief, I was just getting warmed up. And Mirage appears. And then Hound's like, oh, so were we. That is me and my holographic twins. And then Optimus just goes, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we get a brief glimpse back at angry prime from more than meets the eye he's like fine now you do know that like other people use that word just to be like that's fine that's good you know <laughs> but but like i love how you have always inferred that, that was him being like Ugh. well it's in the delivery he goes fine <laughs> fine okay so prime tells them to begin the plan which of course we as viewers did not really get uh, told what that is so we get to watch it unfold and suddenly we're watching footsteps appear uh, up to the front of the lab and a rock randomly rolling up to the front of the lab. (laughs) That's really the best kind of hologram idea you had, like a a rock just rolling up to the front of a lab. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it, it catches Rumble's attention and confuses him at least, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> This, yeah, this scene feels a little bit weird and clumsy, and I feel like they were trying to do something that, like, as a kid, I think I got, the, like, I understood that this was supposed to be funny, and I laughed along with it, but then I watch it again, and I'm like, okay, wait, so Rumble says, I didn't remember seeing that, now what's that? What's he talking about there? And then, like, Mirage calls from off screen, he's like, good question, he's like, who said that? And he turns around, and then, like, Bumblebee flies over his head while he's looking around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then Rumble's like, oh, there's nobody here. I must have static in my rectifiers. And like Mirage calls from off camera again. That's the smartest thing you've said all day. Really? Like, really? really? <laughs> hey. So we basically just see that Rumble is a lovable dope. He's he's not he's not very smart, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh and, oh, and then and then we see Mirage and Hound like while Rumble's looking around too. They sneak into the lab as well. So now uh, Hound, Mirage, and Bumblebee are in the lab. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think when Bumblebee flew overhead, he was holding Spike in his arms too. I think yeah. we saw Spike there. So, you know, the, the the crack team is inside. Megatron is making antimatter. And the key to conquering the universe, he says, bring the Energon cubes and they start filling them up. Now, okay, here we get to something that after I read Thundercracker's file card, I. I, I got to the scene watching it as a teenager. I'm like, wait a second. Thundercracker doesn't feel that way, does he? Because he says, I thought I told somebody to get rid of that boy. And mm-hmm. Thundercracker is like, all right, I'll do it. Now, I, I wonder if there's any like fan and explanation you could develop here. Because like it, on his file card, it said like he secretly sympathizes with the humans, right? Do you remember this? Yeah. I just think at this point, Thundercracker wants to look good in the eyes of Megatron. You know, he, he he wants to get that greetings that Rumble and Laserbeak got. <laughs> Megatron says hi to them. I wish you'd say hi to me just one time. I wish you'd look at me the way he looks at Laserbeak. Um, so, like, the, the fandom that I made up when I was a teenager is, oh, he's doing this so he can let Chip go, right? He's like, mm. oh, with pleasure, I'll get rid of the boy. I'm just going to do it outside so as not to make a mess in here. And then, like, he, like, takes my bags, like, get out of here, get, get out of here, <laughs> you know? I don't think but, he was ever portrayed as that overtly pro-human. No, no I mean, sadly. You know, whether it was on the file card or not, I don't think any of the of the episode writers, you know, took that and ran with it. I wish they would have. I think that would have been interesting. Yeah, it definitely um, would have. But anyway, either way, he's like, with pleasure, I'm going to kill Chip. And then all of a sudden, you know, they hear um, Rai say, hold it right there. And Megatron says, who said that? And there's like 25 hounds in the room. <laughs> We did. We did. We did. We did. <laughs> this, is, this is a sweet shot, though, when Megatron's like, blast them, and then like, he does like this big wind-up. Like, he turns around with his fusion cannon and like points it right at the, the camera and shoots directly at us. <laughs> and then like it, it's like a cool three, three-quarter up shot, or three-quarter up shot, looking up at all the hounds as like the beams pass right through them and blow up the wall behind them. This, this whole scene, like, again, I, these early episodes have really imaginative battle scenes, even if it's not like the greatest diversion in the entire world. Like I'll just make 25 of myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They definitely get a lot lazier later on. Autobots. Let's line up in a row and shoot at the Decepticons while they line up in a row. Yeah. It's so like, while that's happening, Bumblebee rushes in with spike and they get chip and then they, they get out of there. All right, guys, let's, let's, you know, burn rubber and Bumblebee transforms over top of spike and chip mm-hmm. and then runs up the ramp and then hound and Mirage take off after him too. But Starscream holds one of his arm cannons as a gun, and he's about to fire on them. But Mirage appears right in front of him and shoots the gun out of his hand. Maybe you should have left it on your arm, Bozo. No. Oh, yeah. Man. I guess maybe. I mean, we've we've definitely seen Seekers hold their arm cannons before. We saw that in the very first episode with the first Seekers we ever saw. One of them in the, in the background was holding his arm cannon in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you get better aim if you hold it that way. I don't know. It's it's not really worth diving into, I don't think. Not really, but I, I do like the idea of it can be used in multiple ways, right? Mm-hmm. You can have it shoulder mounted or you can use it like a rifle, hold it like a rifle if you want to. And then the, the Autobots, Bumblebee, Hound, and Mirage blast through the window of the lab and land outside and skid in front of Optimus. It's like, all right, Prime, <laughs> It's your game now. I do like this part a lot because, like, Prime is standing there in robot mode. Bumblebee slides in front of him. It's like, the hu- chip's safe. 
Now you can do what you got to do, and they don't show Optimus transform. It just immediately cuts, jump cuts to Optimus in truck mode going at the wall, and we see a little tiny rumble on the wall, right? (laughs) And you just hear him going, where did they (laughs) come from? Oh, that's right. When they smash out of the building, (laughs) Rumble looks over. He's like, well, how did they get here? What's going on? Who am I? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then they land in front of Prime, like, chip safe. It's your game now. And it jump cuts to Optimus in truck mode, heading for the wall. And we just see the little tiny Rumble. And we just hear him scream as (laughs) Optimus smashes through the wall. (laughs) And, And... this is again. This, this is the kind of like the energy that the early shows have that I really, really like. Is that then Optimus like he's in the building, he spins around. We see th- where are the, where's the rest of the guys? Well, the trailer opens up and they all come speeding <sighs> out, you know. And there's that nice shot of them all coming down the hallway really fast in car mode. It just it feels like they were thinking more about how exciting it would be to see transforming robots do things in different modes. Mm. That that we don't we really don't see a lot of later on. So they transform robot mode and they're running down the hall. We gotta get the anti matter cubes before it's too late. And this is a weird scene. It's Megatron standing there holding an energon cube in his hand. And what does he do with it? <laughs> well he's been watching a lot of Earth baseball, so here comes the pitch. <laughs> And he throws an antimatter cube at them, and boom, everyone is dead. Yeah, talk about an act break. Like, he throws the, the cube at the ceiling. All the Autobots look up at it as it's flying to the ceiling, and then it hits the wall. It explodes, and then it cuts to outside the lab, and we see the whole laboratory explode. <laughs> everyone is dead. Everybody is dead. <laughs> yeah, you know, we know what that X-Men cover looks like. Uh Actually, that was also issue five of the Transformers, wasn't it? <laughs> That's right. Um, so we come back from commercial, and they're not all dead. Okay, they were, nobody died. Oh, uh, I wonder when this, this trick is going to stop working on us. <laughs> but everyone's pretty beat up, <laughs> including yeah. Phil Baker and Jazz, who have kind of appeared out of nowhere. It's like one thing this show tends <laughs> to do is yeah. it'll show... Like, I don't know, like, say, six Autobots show up to a place. And then later in the next scene, like, two other Autobots who clearly weren't there before are suddenly there. So I don't know Mm -hmm. if they're just, if they're just late to roll up or (laughs) we don't have gears here to to remark that anyone's late. So we don't know. (laughs) The scene starts with, like, entire walls missing out of the laboratory and all the Autobots are like walking out and they're like limping, they're holding their shoulders and Optimus mm-hmm. is like, all right, let's all head back for repairs. Everybody transform and we see like Trailbreaker and some other guys transform and like when they get into vehicle mode, like the windshields are all smashed out. They got yeah. like cracks and, the, and then it pans over. It's a nice touch. It is. You can actually tell they're significantly damaged. Yeah, uh, which doesn't, again, doesn't happen a lot in this series. Um, and then it, as it pans over, we see them like they do that trick where like two of them transform into vehicle mode and then like they just like sort of like pan to the side and we see all of the other cars so they don't have to animate every one of those transformations. Right. <laughs> but as they pan over, we see Jazz and like his whole front end is like warped. It's like S shaped, you know, mm-hmm. like he's super messed up. And so they head back to Autobot base and then they get there and like, what is it? Uh, Spark plug and Ratchet realize that they got a lot of work ahead of them. And then poor Chip is reprimanding himself, right? Uh, this never would have happened if I had memorized the formula. And this is where Wheeljack says something that's like, again, I know this is a show for kids, and so they they can't, they're going to have to take some liberties with, like, for clarity's sake. But, like, how, how does Wheeljack know there's no way he could have erased his brain? Because I think there's ways for, <laughs> for Transformers to do it. And there was an opportunity for well, a joke. Well, they've been reading all about the humans on Wikipedia or whatever. <laughs> I guess maybe Chip brought in the Encyclopedia Britannica or... <laughs> Scanned it into Teletran 1, and they've been learning that uh, humans can't erase their brains. Was that Chip's brother who advertised the encyclopedia on TV back then? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't thought about that commercial in ages. And there it is. (laughs) Remember me? I'm the kid that had a report due on space. Then I got the new Encyclopedia Britannica. He had a report due on space, and then he got the new encyclopedia. I think I made that abundantly clear. Um, yes. Uh, there's a good place for a joke here where like if Wheeljack would have been like why didn't you just erase your brain that's what I do mm. <laughs> we can't do that Wheeljack can you do that Wheeljack I well, it takes a lot of alcohol <laughs> but he's like oh well don't worry there's a little project I'm working on you guys can help me with it they limped back home but then Megatron's like well 
we're following them now. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> let the Autobots get back to headquarters. But now they've loaded up on antimatter cubes, and they're going to take out the whole base. Megatron says, I will reduce them to dust molecules. <laughs> A little bit better than oil cake. But like, like not just dust, molecules. The molecules that yeah. make dust. That, Even smaller than dust. Like, yeah, like, again, measuring, measuring everything very precisely. And now we get to a scene with Sunstreak and Sideswipe that, like, promises something that I wish we would have gotten more of in the series. Where, like, the two hot shots, like, wow, well, let's go take them all on. Just the two of us. And they, they run out of the arc and they, they start flying. And what, what do they do? Well, they're battling the Seekers, and uh, they put up a valiant fight. But uh, you know, they're they're cars, they're mm-hmm. Autobots. They these two guys somehow, some way, have the power of flight. Maybe they both have rocket packs. I don't know. But they like to do their jet judo in the air. But yeah. uh, the Seekers basically make short work of them, causing them to parachute back to Earth, as Mirage did two episodes ago, and they have that same sort of little parachute. They like start surfing on Thundercracker and Skywarp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Starscream says the one thing you show offs are, show offs are forgetting is is me, and he hits him. And I, what I like about that mm-hmm. line is that I like that it's it's this whole idea of like the narcissism of minor differences. Have you ever heard this expression? Um, mm, I don't think so. It's it's this idea that like you instantly dislike certain people because they're so much like you, but you like, you notice the mm. slightest little difference about them, but yeah, but they're like this, they're right. not like me and Starscream being, you know, the most show offy of the Decepticons. Of course you would hate two Autobots who show both. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I like that. It's him who gets like irritated that they're, and you know, they're making fools out of the seekers after all. But yeah, and then there's this 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 the cute moment where they're like falling back to Earth with their parachute. Sunstreaker's like, oh, I think our jet judo needs a little bit more work. And Sideswipe's like, oh, what makes you say that? This may seem counterintuitive, but I really enjoy the hot shot heroes in these shows. Like later on in the later series, like characters like Smokescreen, Hot Rod, and so on. Mm. I, I, I wish we would have gotten more Sunstreaker and Sideswipe being bros and showing off and doing silly things like that. I think that would have been fun. Michelangelo from the Ninja Turtles, right? Like that kind of character. Yeah. So. Just imagine had this show had a Beast Wars level cast. Mm-hmm. And by that I mean like, imagine there were only like five good guys and five bad guys. Just imagine like the amount of mm-hmm. characterization and time spent on each character we would have gotten to enjoy. But no, they had to come out of the gate with like 20 Autobots and... I don't know, 16 Decepticons or whatever it is. Always remember, parenthetically. We have to really enjoy these little moments that we get because that's going to be all we get. Yeah, it really is. (laughs) I don't think we get much of Sunstreaker and Sideswipe very much. Maybe a couple Mm. more scenes of them in this season. But after that, it's like, yeah, they're pretty much gone. So Megatron lands and... He like has a couple little cubes that he's holding in front of his chest, and he like sucks them into his chest, and he says, All right. <laughs> "Yeah, he just like pushes them into his chest, <laughs> and then he turns into gun mode, and he warns the Autobots that they're about to be toast." Not direct quote, but uh, so he turns into gun mode, and Starscream uh, catches him, and uh-huh. he fires repeatedly at the Autobots, but Prime has turned into truck mode, and he rams him, rams into Starscream causing Starscream to drop Megatron. Well, before we do get to that, we have to acknowledge this scene is like one of the most Starscreamiest Starscream moments in the entire <laughs> canon, right? Because he's he's shooting up the place and like he's really doing damage. Like he shoots at Hound and like all of a sudden like Hound's like in, in the ground. Like he's up to his waist in, in debris from getting like <laughs> sh- just having like Megatron shoot around him. Mm-hmm. And then it comes back to Starscream. He does this little speech, right? He's like, I am invincible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it like, as always, his arrogance is, gets in the way because he's so busy like chanting about how awesome he is that he doesn't seem Optimus coming towards him. Or he does, but he's like, all right, I finally get a chance to kill him. Not noticing, and this is where we get to more of that imaginative uh, battle scenes, that there's this trench that he's driving over top of. In the trench is Brawn. And Brawn yeah. grabs Optimus by the axle and tosses him upwards, right? Like, what a yeah, cool this way. this is a weird plan. I, I dig it. I think it's really cool. Um, 
it's just it's just this idea of like, well, how do we make the idea of Optimus ramming into Starscream more exciting? Well, what if like mm. the second strongest Autobot like gives him a boost and then he like flies over top of Starscream? You know, so like Starscream shooting where Optimus was. But yeah, he knocks the gun out of Starscream's hand and Starscream's like, get the antimatter gun. <laughs> yeah. Not not get Megatron, get the antimatter gun. <laughs> right. Admitting that it's Megatron is like he can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say his name. I hate him so much. Just get the head of matter gun. And Skywar picks it up, right? <laughs> yeah, so Skywar picks up Megatron. But here comes Spike. And Spike is attacking Skywarp's leg with a jackhammer. <laughs> <laughs> is this Wheeljack's big plan? <laughs> <laughs> Bill Jack's like, we'll, we'll do what he least expects. What's that? You attack it with a jackhammer. Won't that do nothing to him? I know. And He'll... might he might he step on me, perhaps? <laughs> well, I haven't worked out the entire plan. <laughs> I did mention that I erase my brain periodically, right? <laughs> we do know this about <laughs> me. <laughs> Skywarp's like, well, what the heck? You know, it's like, it, it, I guess <laughs> the absurdity of it did catch him off guard because he like stops and he yeah. picks Spike up. And then Chip comes in, and Spike was just a distraction because Chip has a device that he sticks on Skywarp's leg. And then what happens? I really like that he's holding Spike here, and he's he's got Megatron pointed directly at him. Yeah, yeah. So if he were to fire Megatron's, you know, antimatter gun mode at Spike, he would just be annihilated completely. Yeah. But surprisingly, kids cartoon doesn't happen. Well, also, we've seen what damage this gun can do, right? Like, in the fact that Skywarp's, like, holding Spike in his hand when he's doing this, if if this were an Adult Swim episode of, you know, like, Robot Chicken, he would fire, and then half of his arm would be gone, too, and he'd be like, oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Chip, courageous Chip, rolls up, sticks a little <laughs> uh, cell phone on Skywarp's leg, and it starts making noises, and then we go inside the arc. We see Teletran 1's doing something. And Wheeljack says, Spike, we did it. And so what happens? So Teletran 1 has taken control of Skywarp. Yeah. And he's having him fire on the other Decepticons. You would think that this would be a plan that they could enact yeah. numerous times. But maybe maybe after doing it once, the Decepticons were sure to change their passwords so no computer could get in and log in remotely. Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> that That's reasonable. They would do something to their programming so it couldn't be overridden that way. But I, the I also... Thundercracker's like, oh, my password's password. I don't want to have to change it. I guess I'll change it to password one, two, three. <laughs> oh... And Reflector's like, my, my password's password three, 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 three. <laughs> But I love about this scene, too, is that, like, and it's probably because they were running out of time. There's so much stuff happening in this episode. But, like, he doesn't, <laughs> yeah. like, shoot at all the other Decepticons. He's just shooting at Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> and Rumble's just, like, jumping around going, help! <laughs> <laughs> make one of the bad guys cute yeah they basically have used this episode to do that and yeah. it'll come up a few other times in the series where it's like even though he's a bad guy rumble's still a cute little guy mm-hmm. yeah it, it's okay if the audience is liking these bad guy characters at least a little yeah you know they give us that amount no i will agree rumble is likable and so Megatron's like, ah, this is this has gotten out of hand, and he transforms into robot mode. But the the antimatter is reaching ignition temperature. In other words, it's going to explode. Um, <laughs> so he flies up as high as he can, dumps the cubes out of his torso, but they, they explode just as he drops them, and it's a big explosion that makes the whole sky turn white. Oh, by the way, little note about the sky in this one. The they did a really interesting sort of color scheme with the sky. I don't know if you noticed it or not, Hoover, but like it was um Mm-mm. it was gray and blue, but then like everything's twinged with like a peach color. And it I, I don't know if the sky ever got used again in the series, but it it gives this episode kind of like a, a different feel. Um it looks like it looks like dusk when they're doing this mm. battle. Um, and not the dusk that they use later on in season two, where it's just like, oh, it's dusk, so everything's red in the sky, like they'll do like a big red uh, sunset. But this feels more like dusk on an overcast day. Um, 
I don't know. Hmm. Just, just it was, it was again. A, which one of us is the artist kid? <laughs> trying to figure it out. It just, it's a uh, visually a little bit. It's it's unique and interesting. But yes, the explosion happens, and then Decepticons run away, right? Yeah. They basically got blowed up pretty much like the Autobots got blowed up at the plant. So now the Decepticons, it's their turn to retreat. This is that nice shot where Megatron flies up and then it does the spin around and screams retreat, like sort of down at his troops. Mm -hmm. Some nice animation here as they all fly away. And then all the Autobots are, are laughing and cheering and Sun <laughs> Sunstreaker picks up Chip and puts him on his shoulder. Yep. Sunstreaker. Yep. And he says, congratulations, Chip. You're a hero. Or you saved the day. You're a hero. And, and it, there's that Ernest Chip again. I did? I, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and again, this is like the, the whole ending of this episode is like my self-insert fanfic because like then Bumblebee's like, you sure did. I'm like, oh, wow, that makes me feel so good. And then Bumblebee says, like, well, you, you may not be an Autobot, but when you rolled for broke back there, you sure could have fooled me. And then it's like, but that's not enough. Like, you got Goosebumps jersey. Wait for it. Then Optimus says to you, we're proud to have you as our friend. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I fall out of the chair. <laughs> oh, Chip Chase, whatever happened to you, man? But while Jersey is swimming in ecstasy, we <laughs> cut to Megatron flying away. And Megatron laments that one boy <laughs> robbed him of his victory. But soon revenge will be his. Yeah, again, self-insert fanfic. Even Megatron hates my guts because because <laughs> I was so brave and so kind and so honest. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. This this is this is one of my like very very favorite episodes. Even though like it doesn't introduce anything all that new to the canon, it doesn't uh, propel a whole lot of story forward. It's like an episodic sort of self-contained thing. But the introduction of Chip Chase and the in the the amount of stuff that happens, the imaginative fighting that happens. This is probably one of the funniest episodes. I mean, there's not a lot of funny Transformers episodes, right? Right. Yeah. Like not in Gen One anyway. Mm -hmm. So this was like the closest we get to like a like a joyful and funny episode. So yeah, I like it a lot. It's got some interesting animation as as Transformers episodes go. Mm -hmm. It's a good mix of everything. It's got uh, good uh, good plot, good twists and turns, good characterization moments, especially for the Decepticons, and introduces Chip, who will be in, I guess, at least a handful of more episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least into season two, because like he is in Megatron's master plan, right? Mm -hmm. And that might be one of the last times we see him. But yeah, he's he's in a handful of episodes this season too. I mean, I know he's in the next one. That we're going to talk about divide and conquer, and that's where we get that that wonderful line: "Nobody's really disabled as long as they have courage." <laughs> oh, Chip! I wish. See, now if I were writing my journal, it'd be like I think Chip would be a neat president. <laughs> <sighs> Any other ten thousand feet up observations about this one for you? Eh. <laughs> Again, when I think about this episode, I just think about like how it was one of the ones that I had on videotape before I had the whole series. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it got a lot of airplay in my house. So it just seems very familiar. Yeah. And it's got a couple good Thundercracker scenes, but it's not like, it's, yeah. not, it's not very. Yeah, easy. I'll never turn down a good Thundercracker scene. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Another thing that they, they did earlier that um, I neglected to mention was that Thundercracker actually mentions two Autobots by name. That and that always stands out to me when they do that. You know, because mm. most of the time when the Decepticons are addressing Autobots, they always just call them Autobot. It's like I right. I hold you in such disdain that I won't even say your name. You know, but or like it doesn't it doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. You know, if if you know if you think about like a typical war situation. You know, typically you're not fighting the same troops all the time, so you don't get to uh, learn anyone's name. But right. but it does always sort of take me aback when the Decepticons say the Autobots' names because it sort of becomes personal. Yeah, he says you don't have Prime and Braun to bail you out this time. So they know who Braun mm -hmm. is, you know? Like, yeah. the Decepticons talk about Braun back home. 
<laughs> yeah. It's, it's not just like you don't have that little green guy who's really strong. It's like you don't have Ron. Yeah, like they're, they're not talking about Gears back home. Right. Well, not yet. <laughs> but in season two, they will. That's true. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think we did another episode. So uh, we record this show weekly. It's collected at 4millionyearslater.com. There is a Facebook page. If you want to join us on the Facebook page, uh, just do a search for 4 million years later. And mm-hmm. you can comment on episodes. You can bring your own thoughts about these particular episodes. You can counter us. You can, you can high five us. <laughs> And uh, they were all wrong. Or this is why you're wrong about Starscream. But you know what? Hoover and I got to do that to each other. So it's like mm-hmm. we're, we're going to disagree a lot on these things. But that's that's what's going to make the show fun to do. And then if you haven't yet, sub- please subscribe. And until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4 million years later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover yet again. Still Hoover. Just Hoover. Okay, bye. Just Hoover. Hoover only. So bye-bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com and if you haven't yet please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts you know how it works <laughs>